All right, excellent. So we're gonna get started today. Uh, today's topic is called Farming the Internet, Building Your Customer Base Through Social Media. And we're really excited to have with, with us today a farmer and a social media expert, Dahlia Dill of Chandler Pond Farm in Vermont uh, from the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, way up near the Canadian border where it's still definitely winter. Um, her farm raises and sells grass-fed beef, hay, cut flowers, vegetables, maple syrup, and probably some other things as well. They have an online store, they have a seasonal farm store, and they sell through some other methods um, in addition. They've built quite an extensive um, customer base uh, utilizing social media and other outreach tools that she's going to share today, some of her tips and tricks, and what she's learned about really um, strengthening custor customer loyalty through good and regular communication. Before we get started, though, I'm going to do a quick little poll to see where is everybody at with regards to using social media for their farm. So the question is, give a, give a minute for people to populate this. What social media platforms do you use, if any? And this is multiple choice. So pick the top ones that you use on a regular basis. So we've got Facebook in the lead, which doesn't surprise me. Instagrams in second. What else do we have? We've got none at 17% so far. Other, ooh, I wonder what's in the other category. Um, ooh, somebody's even using TikTok. All right, what else do we got? We'll give it a few more seconds. Facebook's definitely in the lead. All right, I'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Okay, so what are you using for social media? It looks like Facebook's number one, Instagram's number two, and then we've got none and YouTube tied for third. All right, can everyone see the results? Can you see the results, Dahlia? Um, I do not see them, but I, oh. that, Oh, yeah, there they are. There they are. Perfect. Right. Yeah, looks awesome. about right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass the baton over to Dahlia to get started. All right. little box was a killer last time too. I don't think I can move it. Are you guys seeing this box that says, please move away? Yeah, I see it. Okay. That's so weird. Well, I might just have to leave it. It kind of fades out. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. It was there on the last one I did too and I <laughs> never figured it out. So anyway. Um, if you guys don't mind that, we'll just get going. So I am Dahlia Dill, and like Rebecca said, I um, have my own farm in Vermont, which I run with my, in, my husband and his parents um, in partnership. And I also am the marketing director for a regional feed company uh, here on the East Coast. So a lot of people sometimes hear that and think that I had a background in marketing before I started doing it for my own business. And that is not the case. In fact, it is the exact opposite of that. So um, when we started our own farm uh, in 2000, well, 2000, 16 was really when we started um, at the capacity that we're at right now. And when we did that, we moved states to our new um, property and I got a new job with this company, um, started in the office. And then as time went by, they kind of realized that I had a lot of these other skills that had been self-taught things, including marketing for my own business, the social media aspect, all, you know, marketing as a whole. 
um, was something that I spent a lot of time developing for myself and our own things. And they uh, recognized and appreciated those skills. So then I moved into um, a full-time position doing that for this much larger company as well, which has been really fun. And Rebecca referred to me as a social media expert, which is very nice. And I will take all of the compliments I can get, but I am still a student of this. It's like one of those things that you never become a like top expert in because it is always changing. Even if you know all the things, there is always, it's constantly evolving. There's always more to learn, which makes it super interesting and something that it just is really easy to, um, to keep a flow with. So you'll never really get to the very top of it, but, and there are definitely people who have much larger followings than I do um, on social media, but it is a super important part of our business. And it's been something that we've really depended on to get us to where we are right now. And our, our customers are very invested. So um, I'll give you guys a little background on where I'm coming from. So we're in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, which is about 40 minutes south of the Canadian border. And um, my husband and myself both went to college for agricultural majors, um, kind of knew that we always wanted to have our own farming business. We had always had things on the side, like even while we were in school, um, we had started our own small herd of beef cattle. We were doing some haying on the side, you know, we started like purchasing hang equipment when we were way younger. And that was, we've kind of in, been investing in the farm thing instead of other <laughs> things as we've grown up. And we knew that the farm was where we really wanted to settle our roots. So when we found uh, the property that we're on right now in Vermont, uh, it was through the Vermont Land Trust and they were looking for a new person to take over this property and purchase this property that was um, had been owned by a landowner who was not the farmer but had always rented it out to uh, people doing the farming and their current tenant decided that they were done with other life endeavors and that's when the landowner decided that she was ready to sell so we went through a competitive proposal process and there were applicants from all over the country um, who wanted to do different things here. And they had a panel of uh, industry experts essentially who went through our, our business proposal and our plans for what we would do. And they uh, ultimately chose us as the people to take over. So we got lucky there. They thought we had a great plan. And part of that plan was that we knew that we were going to direct market all of our products. So my husband and I both came from dairy based backgrounds growing up. Um, I lived on a dairy farm for quite a while as a child that my dad had um, was on the management team for Mark's parents uh, had raised dairy replacement heifers for a lot of farms in the area. And so dairy was kind of one of those things that we really loved and was really important to us. And we thought that maybe that was what we wanted to do. But as you all probably know, is such a difficult industry recently. So um, we kind of decided that even though we love dairy, that wasn't, we were not going to be starting a dairy farm and be sh commercially shipping milk. So we had quite a list of things that we wanted to accomplish, products that we wanted to have, um, but we knew for sure that we did not want to be wholesaling the majority of them. We wanted to be really building a relationship with our customers directly and moving our products that way because you have a lot more control over your price and uh, your profit and where you're selling and all of that. So it just gives you a lot more flexibility and 
um, usually ends up to be a better financial decision for people, but the marketing piece is its own beast entirely. So not only do you have, you know, the actual production end of the farm, but then getting the product sold and building a relationship with the customers is, is a whole nother enterprise basically. So I've taken on the majority of that, um, within our business and, but it's proven to be super, like definitely one of the most important things for us. So I'm hoping to share with you guys some super actionable things that you can apply. Like today you can get off this conversation. You can go on your social media and you can start to ramp it up a little bit, start to get your customers really engaged and, and be really invested in your business. So um, these are just some pictures of things that we have going on. So we do some pick your own, Blueberries and strawberries, that's a big draw for us um, to our on-site farm stand. Uh, we do have a big, beautiful red barn, which is very iconic in Vermont. So people love to see that. We also raised Belted Galloway beef cattle, which is a breed that I grew up with. Um, so that is part of our beef herd there. Grazing, they're all 100% grass fed. So um, people love to see them out on the hillside and moving around the pastures. And we also, um, we breed and raise all of our animals. So we are having calves and people love to see the whole life cycle and know that the, that animal came from our property and was raised here and we know everything about it. So these are just also a couple of pictures of our beef. Our farm stand, um, which used to be a chicken coop and people love it, it's rustic and um, it's open seasonally because it doesn't have windows and doors. So not open right now in the middle of uh, winter, we switched to some other methods like via online and delivery. Uh, we also do quite a bit of hay for our area to feed our own herd and for sale to other area farms and people with um, horses and other livestock. So, so into the good stuff. Can you guys still see okay, Rebecca? This box is bothering me, but it won't let me move it. We'll just ignore it. Okay, so you guys probably have a pretty good idea already of what social media really is, but just to give everybody a, a background, we're talking mostly today, probably about Facebook and Instagram, which is, it looks like where most of you guys are right now anyway, which is great and a pretty accurate, um, pretty accurate description, I think, of where a lot of consumers are too. So that was good to see. But some other things that you might see or hear about is like Pinterest and Twitter. Um, blogging is technically a form of social media. Um, and there's a million other things out there that maybe aren't quite as popular as Facebook and Instagram, but are definitely areas that you can reach people. So um, some people, wonder why social media is even something that they should be worrying about. So there's a lot of opinions. People have different takes on the value of social media and whether or not it's somewhere that you should even spend your time. Um, and there is definitely credibility in a lot of those different thoughts. But the fact of the matter is that 70% of adults in all of the United States of America use Facebook and 75% of those adults use it every single day. So it is absolutely still relevant. It is absolutely still somewhere where people are on a very regular basis and you would be doing yourself a huge disservice to not show up there. So even if you have a few friends that have said, I'm gonna take a break from social media and not do this for a little while, it is still super valuable for your business specifically to be there. You don't have to show up on a personal level, but as if your business is present, you're gonna see results. So um, the underlying goal of being on any of these platforms is obviously exposure for your business and your products and your story. 
engagement with your customers. So that's why they call it social media. You're supposed to be social. People are supposed to be social with you and you need to inspire that engagement because Facebook is going to, or any social media platform is going to favor you if you are being social. So um, engaging with your customers and collecting people. So really social media is not at all the be all end all situation of your marketing plan. It is a very small piece of it and it's kind of at the top of your funnel. So if you imagine um, kind of this is this is a funnel. So social media is at the very top of it. So when you're collecting people on social media, you're engaging with them there. And there's a lot of information going on at the level of the social media itself. But what you're really doing is collecting people into a space that you have much more control over. So you might have heard um, or seen or experienced that Facebook and Instagram have been becoming much more difficult to work with for people who are involved with animal agriculture or um, animal products in general. People are, are experiencing a lot of difficulty um, being flagged for posts that have to do with meat products or animals for sale in general. And those things are probably going to continue to happen as much as we hate it and we know that it's not right, but there are reasons that they're making those decisions. And the reality of the situation is that you do not have control over your social media accounts. So Facebook and Instagram are, they're owned by the same company. Facebook owns both of them. There's a little bit of a monopoly going on there, but they can really call the shots. So if they decide that they don't want anybody selling meat, they can, they can do that. And we don't have any control over that. I've seen people get kicked off um, their accounts and losing, you know, they can in a split second, take away your entire audience from you. And that's super scary and something that we hope will never happen to any of you. But um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be fully utilizing the platform for what you can. So it's still a great way to be collecting people and getting them to the platforms that you do own, like your website, and most importantly, getting them on your email list. So your email list you do own. You've probably heard everybody who's ever talked to you about marketing say that the email list is super important, but it really, really is. So if tomorrow Facebook and Instagram decide that they are deleting your account for whatever reason they choose, you lose all of those people. But if you have moved them over to your website and your email list, you still own their contact information. They can't take that away from you, but they can take away your, your list of followers on Facebook or Instagram. So, so what we're really doing with those platforms is funneling people into, um, into a place where we have complete control over staying in constant contact with them. And once they're there, they're probably much more interested in your business. They want to be involved. They want to hear from you often. Um, and the other big difference is on social media, if you have a million followers and you post something, only a fraction of your follower list is actually ever going to see that post in their feed naturally, unless they specifically go to your page and look for it, it does not get shown to every single one of your followers. When you send a message out to your email list, it goes into every single person's inbox. They might not all open it, but they all see it come across their screen. That just enough, uh, just seeing your name on a regular basis is enough to keep their brain, kind of keep you top of mind uh, in their thoughts. So the email list is really where we're ultimately sending people, but um, Social media is how we're collecting a lot of them to get them there. So back to the very basics, which um, sometimes I think a lot of us take for granted that people understand these concepts. So I'm just going to go over them real quick. Uh, 
you have to have a personal account in order to build a business account on Facebook. So it, you don't have to be active on a personal page, but you do have to physically build one in order to start a business account for yourself. It can't be freestanding. It has to be linked to a person's account. Um, second thing is for your business page, you really need to have an actual business page, not a personal account for your business. So in Facebook land, there are accounts for people with a first and last name, and there are accounts for businesses. And you really need to make sure that you set one up for a business for multiple reasons. Um, but if nothing else, Facebook recognizes the difference between those two things, and it hates when people try to use them for things that they're not supposed to be used for. So make sure that you're setting up an actual business page and not just using a personal account with a business name on it, if that makes sense. Um, so the other reasons that you should be sure to do that are that Facebook and Instagram give business pages specific insights and analytics um, that are really helpful to businesses and they have no limit on the amount of people that can follow you or friend you. So on personal pages, I think the limit is like 5,000. You can only have 5,000 friends. So if you try to create a personal page as a business and people are friending you, Facebook's going to top you off at 5,000, um, which is not ideal. So create that business page, get the analytics and the insights that it offers you. It's super valuable data and they're not going to cap you at any amount of followers. So I keep trying to move this box and it's really bugging me. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So social media as a whole is very, very visual. So people are drawn to pictures generally, not so much text only posts. So using great photographs is going to be like paramount to your success here. So a lot of people get really worried about that and say, uh, I don't have a really fancy camera or I'm going to have to hire a professional photographer because I'm not good at taking pictures or whatever. And those are all valid concerns, but I'm here to tell you that you don't need to worry about any of them. All you need to do is go to your local cell phone store and get a smartphone. <laughs> They're all super good in the camera department. Um, these days we're really lucky because once you make that investment for your cell phone, you also have a really great camera on your hands at all times. So um, get a great cell phone camera. It doesn't matter if it's an iPhone or an Android. I have both. I have one for work and one for personal and they are both awesome. So you can't go wrong either way um, there. So another really important thing is to make sure that you're taking pictures in your camera app itself and not through the social media platform. So if you go, if you log into Instagram um, and you click create a new post, it offers you the option to take a picture right there within the Instagram app. Don't use that. It creates a much lower, um, it's a more pixelated picture. The quality is not as good as if you take all of your pictures in your camera itself and just use those in Instagram. Just to pick them out of your gallery. Um, another thing that a lot of people don't think of when they see other people's accounts with lots of pictures of uh, the people themselves, that you, these cameras have the ability to set a timer on them set them down somewhere, walk away and get a picture of yourself. So you don't have to, it might look like someone else is taking the pictures for these people. If you're looking at their other accounts and you see pictures of them all the time, but that's probably not the case. What they're doing is setting a timer on their camera, putting it down on a bale of hay or on a fence post or whatever, walking away. So you're in frame and waiting that five or 10 seconds or whatever you set it to. And they're taking a picture of themselves and that's the cheap way to do it. And it's also, uh, it's, it's really easy. So you do not have to hire someone to take pictures for you. Just play with that timer and get some pictures of yourself. So another great thing to explore if you haven't already is, um, 
editing that is available just within your own camera, you know, in your phone, in your camera app, there are tons of editing options. They're super easy to use. Sometimes it's as simple as increasing the brightness on your picture a little bit so it's not so dark and shadowy. Um, that can make a huge difference in the, the look and feel of your picture from being kind of subpar to looking really professional. So playing around with those, um, with those editing features, there's also tons of apps out there that you can use, you know, you download them separately and, um, and use their editing features. But in reality, you can really just start with your, your cameras or your phone's own editing features. Um, Instagram also has great editing features within it. So um, lots of preset like filters, people call them, which are just preset uh, edits that you can kind of scroll through and see how different they make your picture look. So you can try those out too. Um, and stockpiling pictures while you have the chance to take them is a great way to just have a, a lot of material in your back pocket that you can pull from on days when it's not when you don't have time or the weather is not great or whatever. Um, so just, you know, take pictures every day that you're outside doing things and you have some material and then just keep them. You don't have to share them all at one time. Just keep them in your gallery and reach back to them throughout the year when you don't have time to, to do something super fresh. So the last bit about pictures that I will share if you don't take anything else away from this presentation, remember to show your face. This is like the number one thing that I will recommend to you. You have to put your face on your business's social media account. It has to be there. People do not connect with pictures of your product and they don't connect with they love cute calf pictures, but they don't, everybody has cute calf pictures, guys. We all have really cute calves. No one has ugly calves. It's not like unique to you, <laughs> but your face is unique to you. And that's what, when someone finds your account on social media and they start scrolling through your pictures, they're gonna be looking for you. They want to see who is behind it, who they're hearing from, what you look like, because if they're going to be finding you at farmer's market or coming to your farm or buying from you, they're going to want to know who you are. And that's what is going to set you apart. So if you remember nothing else from all of this, get a picture of yourself or somebody else at your farm. If you don't love being in pictures, I said <laughs> the last time when Rebecca was watching this uh, presentation, either get over it and figure out a way to be comfortable in your own skin, you know, showing off your own farm or find someone else in your business that is comfortable. It might be your spouse or even an employee or somebody that people are going to be able to see and relate to as a real person. So um, the next piece to your posts is going to be your caption. So the words are really equally important to the pictures. The pictures are what's going to be catching people's eye, but then they're going to want to read what you have to say about it. So a really important thing to remember is that only the first few words of your caption show. When someone is being served your post, they're only going to see the first few words. I think this screenshot is from Facebook. Instagram. I don't remember, but on the other, I, on Instagram, even less words show than this. So you get served like maybe the first one or two lines of your caption. So starting with something that's going to be really catchy for people is key. Um, so this was a, a fun post that we did 10 things you might not know about us. So when you see that start to the caption, people are kind of like, oh, well, what might I not know about them. There must be something interesting here. I guess I'm going to click see more and read the whole thing. And so starting off with something that really hooks them in is going to get them to read the rest of your post. Um, also spacing out your text so that it's not in one huge block paragraph form is 
is going to make it much easier on people's eyes to be able to take in that that amount of information. Even if you do have a super long caption, a long post, you have a lot of things to say, that's okay. And they'll probably read it as long as it's not deaf to their eyes. So you need to put some spaces in between paragraphs or um, use something to break it up so that they can take it in a little easier. Uh, as far as the content in your captions, talking about like meaningful things or things that are going on on the farm in daily life, talk about what the caption is, why it's important, or you know something interesting that happened today, or something that you were thinking about when you were cleaning out the barn, or um, something meaningful that's that kind of makes people think and engage with that content. And asking questions is a great way to get people engaged. So if you remember the Kind of the goal of all of this is to get people to be social with you it's social media so uh, facebook and instagram love it when people engage with your content then they show it to more people you get higher up in their ranking in the algorithm which is what decides who who that platform is showing your content to um so if you if you're asking questions or you're, like you're asking for people's input about something that people like to have input about. People really love to give their opinions on anything, basically. So, you know, if you're pulling out a pound of ground beef for dinner and you might know what you're gonna make with it, but maybe you post something that says, what's your favorite ground beef recipe? All out of ideas for tonight. What are you guys thinking? Like, what's your favorite thing to make? People love to tell you what they think. <laughs> so just give them an opportunity to do that and they will do that. Um, so then you're getting all the comments, you're getting the engagement, you can talk back and forth with them and people start to, to realize that you're somebody that they can start to have a relationship with. Um, keeping negatives to a minimum is something that people have a, a hard time navigating, I think, sometimes. So um, there's a lot of a lot of discussion about what level of transparency is really appropriate in your posts. And it's the good news is it's kind of up to you with your comfort level and there's no like super right or wrong answer, but I think a good general rule of thumb is that you can share the good, the bad, but not the ugly. So we all know that there are things in ag and on farms every day that are not picture perfect. It's not rainbows and butterflies all the time. And it's really important to be transparent with your customers about the real life things and they really care and they want to know about those things because that's what makes you know that's what makes your small business so different and attractive to them is that you're not a huge corporation there's you know things that happen every day that um that you have to grapple with and that's okay to share with them but there's a there's kind of a line where you can share those things and still be tasteful about it so even if there's something bad that happened or um, something that really made you sad or upset, you can absolutely share that. Just maybe put a twist on it that, um, that you know, was something, it was a learning experience and uh, talk about the things that you're taking away from it that are not just the dreary, like your life is over sort of feeling. Um, if you have animals that die, you know, it might be an animal that that you've been sharing about or that people have an investment in. And it's absolutely OK to share those things and just honestly talk about um, the reality of the situation. But people probably don't need to see like the dead body or the butchering of an animal or um, things like that. You can share about them in a tasteful manner. So. You guys might have questions on that. We can talk about it more openly after. But um, the last thing here is that people want you, they want to be able to look to you as an expert in your field. So you are the boss of your own social media page. People, you are the expert in your business. You are the business owner. The business is you. So people want to hear from you in a way that is confident about um, 
what you're doing or like how to use your products. They want you to be there for them and tell them what they should be doing with it or how, you know, what the best way to cook your product is or whatever it may be. Um, they want to feel like you're guiding them through that. So um, overall, the goal is to inspire engagement. Remember, it's social media, so you have to be social. So hashtags are another topic that had kind of a bad rap for quite a while and maybe still does. Sometimes people don't understand that hashtags actually do have a purpose and they're not just a trendy thing. So um, they kind of have three purposes. And the first one is to organize your own content. So when you hashtag, when you add a hashtag to the end of your post, uh, either in the post itself or in the comments of that post on Instagram specifically, um, hashtags are searchable. And that's really the only way that Instagram is searchable. So people can follow hashtags that they're interested in, like, for example, grass fed beef, maybe you can follow that hashtag as an Instagram user and Instagram will automatically show you posts that are tagged with that hashtag. So um, if you want to organize your own content in a way that people can, for example, see all of the posts about your specific beef, um, you could tag it hashtag CPF beef or Chandler Pond Farm beef. And then when you search that hashtag, you see all of my posts about our beef specifically. Um, the second purpose is to, to tag your overall brand. So kind of the same concept if you wanted to search all of Chandler Pond Farm um, posts and even maybe posts that other people have tagged, like um, like if people come to pick strawberries here or shop in the farm stand, they take really cute pictures of you know their experience. They might tag their post also with Chandler Pond Farm, and that's going to show up in that list of all the posts tagged with Chandler Pond Farm. Um, and the third reason is to help you get new visibility. So if you're using larger, more general hashtags like hashtag Vermont farm, for example, if someone follows or has engaged with other posts that have used that hashtag, Instagram will show you more related content that uses that. So um, if you've ever gone to your explore page, which is just like a feed of posts from accounts that you do not necessarily already follow, but are related content to things that you're already engaging with. Um, that's where you would show up for someone who has interacted with posts with that hashtag before. So that's a way to gain visibility among users who aren't already following you. Um, so hashtags are really primarily an Instagram tool. There's some, the jury's kind of out on the use on Facebook right now, they are starting to, to play with offering them a little bit more, but I don't think um, Facebook has as strong of a background with the hashtag use. So um, really focus on them on Instagram mostly. Using eight to 10 of them per post is kind of a good rule of thumb. You don't need like a hundred hashtags at the end of your post. You shouldn't just type out a whole bunch of them and keep them in your notes and use the same ones every single time you post because Instagram actually recognizes that and kind of tags those as spammy because it doesn't, it wants you to use things that are relevant to, to that post specifically and not just use the same ones over and over and over. Um, and like I said, you can actually put those eight to 10 tags at the end of your post, or if you want to keep your uh, caption a little bit cleaner, you can put it in the comments and, and Instagram recognizes those tags the same way as it would as, as if it were actually in your um, in your text itself. So for posting uh, times, the most important thing to remember probably is to be consistent about it. So um, and and remembering that you're really focusing on having quality posts over quantity. So every time you get on social media, uh, it's good to remember 
that you should really create versus consume first, because I think we all know that it's pretty easy to get on there and start to scroll and then you lose track of time and like you've lost all the time that you've dedicated to, to getting on and posting something. So do your creation first, do your posting first, and then do your scrolling as a reward to yourself after the fact. Um, being consistent with your posting is also going to help Instagram or Facebook or whatever the platform is. Um, it's going to help you with within the algorithm that decides who and how often it should be showing your post to people. So it likes consistency. Um, by being consistent, you're going to stay more top of mind with your customers. It's just all around a good idea to be uh, just decide what your what your cadence is and kind of stick with that. Um, try to keep your content fresh. So current events or things that are going on right now, like people like to know what's going on now. Not necessarily, you know, not that you can't bring up things that that happened two weeks ago or like do a throwback to last season or stuff like that. But people generally want to kind of keep up with what's going on with the day to day and, you know, what's relevant in this time. Um, if you are on this, is, this is kind of a general rule, unless you have a huge account already, like in the hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, but try to keep your general feed posts to no more than one a day. So Facebook or Instagram um, has your feed, which are like your stagnant, uh, your wall posts or your feed posts that are separate from your stories, your reels, um, and like IGTV, any of that. So try to do no more than one feed post a day. Um, but if you have more to share in one day, stick into your stories. So Instagram uh, stories are a super good way to stay like in the minute engaged with your followers and, and keep your followers engaged with you. So um, you might, you probably have things going on all day long and it's hard to pick, you know, one important thing that you want to post about today. So why not share all of it? And people love to you know, sit on their couch at night and watch your day unfold. So um, you can share, I think it's up to like 125 stories a day. So you have tons of opportunities to just put short informal snippets of information in your stories um, that cover a lot of different things that are happening. And people love to watch those and engage with them. Um, and then using the latest features that these platforms are offering is also really key to staying at the top of the algorithm. So stories are great. Video is super important and reels, which is the newest uh, kind of in thing that Instagram released uh, to compete with TikTok. And reels is like a 15 or 30 second long video that you can kind of splice together um, and you can add text over the top of it, it can have music. Uh, and those are super engaging to people and they are short enough 15 or 30 seconds to keep their attention. And that's really about all we have to work with, um, with people's attention spans these days. So using those features is going to help Instagram and Facebook recognize you as someone that they want to join more often. So post timing is um, something that is likely pretty, can be really specific to your own audience, but this is a global engagement chart of when people are engaging the most on Facebook. So um, overall, the highest engagement is from Tuesday to Thursday, kind of during daytime hours. So 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the lowest engagement is before seven o'clock. So when people are still sleeping, or after five o'clock at night, any day. Um, that you might see some difference in your own audience and that's probably highly likely. Um, this is just kind of a broad overview. So in order to see your own audience's activity, you can go to analytics um, or insights like I talked about before, and it gives you a ton of data. So um, age range of your followers, 
the genders of your followers, the times that they're most active, and that's going to be specific to the people that are on your own account. So um, really relevant to you. And then you can take that information and act on it. So you really want to be posting when, you're in, when your audience is engaging, because that's the time that is most likely for them to be engaging with your posts if you're posting them. So um, generally, we talk a lot about vanity metrics like followers. I do not have the largest amount of followers of of any social media by far. We have, I think, maybe 2,500 or so followers on Facebook, but they are super, super engaged. When we drop a bit of information about product being available, our customers are on it. Like they are here, they are ready to buy our product. And that's what matters more than having a million followers. Um, so the way that you measure that on your social media itself is by engagement, impressions, um, which is kind of a count, it's a, pulse on how your audience is liking your content and how well Facebook or Instagram likes your content and how often it's showing it to people. So there's just some benchmarks here. Um, I'll show this. I'll share the PDF later with Rebecca. So you guys can refer back to this if you want. So engaging really quickly after you post, um, there's like a 10 minute window. You want to be replying to people if they're commenting, don't post and ghost. So um, Keep up with that engagement. Answer all of your messages and your comments. Don't leave people, you know, without answers. Um, tag other businesses to, you know, maybe be exposed to people that are watching their content. Um, and interacting when your customers are active. So, uh, lots of things here, and I, I don't want to draw this out too long, but. Um, getting to other related pages and groups and places where your um, where your target customer is already hanging out. And maybe it's people who are interested in health or wellness and there are moms in your area. There's tons of groups out there that you can join and you can start interacting with those people and they're gonna figure out who you are and that you have a business and you have product available that's probably really relevant to them. So. Um, not being afraid to put yourself out there. People won't know about you unless you talk about your business and having somewhere to send them. So that website and that email list to get them on your, on your nurture plan uh, to turn them into paying customers is really the end goal here. So, and, and asking your customers to be engaged and um, asking for a photo or a tag when they make dinner with your product or, or whatever it is, and just don't be afraid to ask them to tag you in it. All right, so, Dahlia, we have to go yeah. to questions. Do you have any more to share before we go into questions? Just this last slide. So this is the wrap up. Um, so overall, just remember that you're here to entertain, inspire, educate, engage with your customers, build a, a relationship with them. Um, and it doesn't have to be salesy. Social media is not meant to be where you are making your sales. It's meant to be social with your customers and build a relationship with them. So share about your lifestyle. People are not all farmers and they do not all understand what goes on on the farm in your daily life. So it is super interesting to people when you are doing things that you think are very mundane on a day to day basis. They want to see that. Um, so your story is worth telling. People want to connect with you. That's how you're going to turn them into loyal customers who are going to tell all of their friends about you and, and turn into paying customers. So that's it. And, um, and don't forget to put your face on your social media. Thank you, Dahlia. So folks can pop questions into the Q and A box. Um, but while that is queuing up, um, my top question for Dahlia is, how do you know that your social media customers are turning into, or social media followers are turning into paid customers? Yeah, so there is a little bit of a disconnect there between the tangible, um, there are some situations where you can actually tell exactly who has 
gone from a post to making a purchase. For example, if you have e-commerce and you are actually selling, um, say, listing a product on social media itself, for a lot of us who are selling animal related products, Facebook and Instagram don't like those things. So we can't actually post them there. So there um, is a little bit of a disconnect between people jumping to your website and actually making a purchase. It can be hard um, sometimes to make that exact count, but the things like um, engagement rates are a pretty good indication. I think if you kind of follow the trend there, if you have much lower engagement and uh, much less reach with your posts, you're probably not, you're just flat out not being seen by as many people and not as many people are engaging with your content. Once that starts to creep up and you start to see more people engaging with your content, um, you can typically see like, for example, the traffic to your website is up or your sales are up. In if you are, for example, doing something really specific like making a post about a sale that you're offering or something that is really uh, something that's happening now, you can watch like when you make that post versus when you see those orders rolling in three minutes after you made your post, you can pretty much attribute that to, to your social media posts. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it kind of is situation dependent, but yeah, like um, a flash sale or putting in a coupon code, right? You yeah. Can see if that actually gets utilized. Yep. Or like, hey, we're releasing this new um, box that's available. Like, if you're shipping product, um, or we're doing a delivery to this area this weekend. Like, place your orders now, and you start seeing those orders roll in. You know that it's working. Okay. A few questions that have come in. Heather asked, how frequently do you email customers? In other words, how do you find the balance of keeping them engaged via email, but not overwhelming their inbox? And then second question from Heather, do you recommend a certain platform like Constant Contact for email interactions? Yeah, so for email in general, um, not everybody understands that the reason why we use platforms like Constant Contact or MailChimp or MailerLite or any of those things is that it's actually illegal to do a mass email to your customers from a from like your your email address itself. So you can't just go on your Gmail account and send out a mass a list uh, a mass mailing to 200 people. That's what is considered spam. So you actually have to go through one of these platforms, which basically sends the email out for you and, and manages your list of contacts and gives people the option to unsubscribe to your list if they want to. Um, so that's why we use those platforms. If you're looking for a recommendation for one specifically, I have a lot of answers. <laughs> um, it is really going to depend on your like the size of your business where you're at with it um and how much money you want to spend and kind of what your goals are so we personally for our farm email list i am using mailer light which i started with and i have not switched off of yet because it has a great free option to start off with and it gives you like a certain limit of subscribers the, and you never pay a dime for it, which is great. And it's super easy to use and it accomplishes what you have to accomplish. But once your list starts getting larger and you need to have a little bit more control over what you're doing with it, um, there are tons of other great options that start to cost you a little bit of money, but give you a lot more flexibility. So like um, MailChimp is another one. I use that for, um, for our email list through my job and Flowdesk is another one that um, a lot of people are using now that has a ton of flexibility and options. Um, but any of any of those are really great to use. I haven't used Constant Contact personally, but I know that that's another one that is out there. So it's kind of personal preference. They are all very similar. Um, just depends on what you're looking for. What was the first part of that question? Oh, how often? Weekly, monthly? Yeah, that's also going to be kind of 
um, personal preference, but I would recommend to stay consistent with whatever you decide. So um, it's great to have kind of a, if you give yourself a schedule, like you know you're gonna send out one email a month and you've decided that monthly is good for your business because that's like maybe you are, um, maybe you're sending animals to butcher once a month or, and you have a big, you know, restock of your inventory or something like that. Um, so that would be a relevant time frame for you. Um, if you have more product to move and you have like new things that are available more frequently, you could absolutely do once a week um, and just, just stay consistent with it. So that's kind of going to be personal preference for you according to your business as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, couple of things I wanted to mention. There's, there's one platform called convert kit. That's really yep. good for creating the funnels. So yes. if you want to put on your Instagram or Facebook, certain um, opportunities, like um, get this free recipe booklet. If you enter in your email, um, then it, it creates a template for that grabs people's emails, pops them into convert kit email database and then can send them the follow-up um, guidebook that you created. Yep. And that's a great way to mine um, emails as well. And it's pretty affordable too. Yeah, so you can do that like transitional call to action or like a, an, a value, you know, an offer for um, something of value that you're giving away for free to get people's email mm -hmm. or get them to sign up for your list. And you can set up, um, ConvertKit can do it, but any of these, basically all the platforms can do that. They just offer different levels of um, flexibility there. So I think on some of the free, uh, the free plans, it only allows you to do like one um, auto email. So when people sign up, it might automatically be able to send them an offer like that or whatever you set it up to be. Um, but some of these other plans offer much more extensive, like you can send them a whole nurture sequence of um, like, welcome to our farm. The first email is a, um, a short video or like a short, um, you know, tour of the farm or like a PDF on how to cook steak perfectly or like what to, how to boil your eggs or something like that. So yeah, there's tons of options and, um, and lots of ways to get there. All right. Uh, Mary asked, have you ever boosted your Facebook posts? If so, how successful has it been for you? And do you recommend it? Yeah, so basically everything that we just talked about um, in this presentation is all about organic reach on social media. So unpaid stuff. And that's where you should definitely spend the majority of your time. There is absolutely value in boosting posts or um, technically in making paid ads, uh, boosting, boosting posts is a little bit than making, it's a little bit different than um, doing paid ads. It has a little bit less flexibility, but they kind of both are theoretically accomplishing the same thing. And that's putting money behind that post to um, allow it to be shown to more people that you specifically choose. So I have done it. Um, I do it for our farm business very infrequently, only when we have something that is like, that we're either trying to draw more people to or um, something that's new or like we're trying to reach a different population of people than we normally do. Um, so the thought behind it is that you can pay Facebook or Instagram to show that post to people in a specific area or who have specific interests. Um, so that they see it when they otherwise wouldn't. So I wouldn't recommend spending a ton of money on Facebook uh, or, or Instagram ads unless you really know what you're doing with them because it is also a super, super easy way to waste all of your money if you don't do it correctly. So if you focus on just building your audience and engaging with them and, um, and building that relationship through your organic reach, that's gonna be the key for you. Yeah. I agree. I think for special events, I've seen some success there or classes yeah. that you're offering. Yeah. Otherwise, organic reach is the best way to go. Yeah. Um, Heather asks, I have my accounts linked. So for those that don't know what that means, um, since Facebook and Instagram are owned by the same company, 
you can have those accounts linked so that when you post to Instagram, you can have it automatically populate your Facebook business page, which is a great way to go, you know, feed yep. two birds, birds with one scone. Um, but what do you think, does it matter if you post the same exact content to Facebook and Instagram or should you mix it up a little bit? Um, if you are really trying to grow on both of the platforms, it's probably better to mix it up. But if you are really putting your your energy into growing one platform where you know your your key customers are and your you know where your perfect customer is really living, that's where you should be focusing all of your energy anyway. So, um, like I I also link my accounts and I just copy over the same to both of them. And you will always have one Facebook or Instagram that you have more engagement on. And that's probably where your customers are really living. Um, so in order to keep presence on both of them, it's a great way to do that. But uh, you're probably going to have a stronger following on one than the other. That's a good point. Yeah. And it, and it pays to know where your ideal customers hang out. You know, some of them are more likely to hang out on Facebook. Some are more likely to hang out on Instagram or some of these other platforms. So yeah. um, you don't need to waste your time thinking around on platforms where your ideal customers are not spending their time, you know. Um, yeah. Just a few more questions. We're going to run a couple minutes over the hour. Uh, Michael asked, do you worry about privacy, i.e. crazy folks knowing your Facebook, Instagram photos and cross-referencing cross with your private life? Good question. Yeah, so a lot of people ask this and especially with like children also is a common question. So um, we don't have kids, so I don't post a lot of pictures of kids, but I'm sure that that's something that a lot of people think about. Um, for us, our business is very closely linked to our private life. Our farm, we live on our farm, we live directly across the road from our farm stand. We are the people who run our farm. Um, we are the people that you see at farmer's market. If you're buying from us there, we're the ones that you see if you come to buy from us here. So like, there's really not a good way to separate those things because we are the business. Um, I am really careful about not you do have to be smart about like when what you're sharing and when you're sharing it. So like, for example, if you are lucky enough to get away on a short vacation um, with your spouse or with your family, maybe don't post about being gone when you are gone. <laughs> wait until you're back. Wait until everything is back to normal before you let the world know that you've left your house and you've left your business free for you know, ransacking. Um, so stuff like that, just think uh, kind of intelligently about before you share, but there's no reason why you can't share fairly personal things if, if that is your business. Um, but of course it's personal preference. So if there's stuff you're not comfortable with, no one's making you share either. Yeah. Uh, Marla asks, uh, oh, she asked the same question about Facebook ads, which we already covered. Um, Heather asks, how do you get notifications on Facebook when activity occurs on your business page and not on your personal account? Um, so I think you're asking about getting notifications for activity that is happening on your business page. Yeah. If you are set up with a business page, there is, um, something called business suite, which Facebook likes to use to manage your business pages because you might have multiple, um, multiple business pages. And if you're on there, it is super easy to set up notifications um, very specifically to how you want them. So you might choose not to get certain notifications about like people liking your page, but you might wanna know when someone's commenting on something so you can act on it. Um, so you just, just explore in there. Um, set up that business suite. I think it's actually, it's a separate app for your phone, but it's all linked together. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions for today, Dahlia. I really appreciate your time. 
I, I learned a lot of good stuff. Uh, we will be posting this recording up on our YouTube channel by tomorrow. So you can revisit it or send it to your friends. And Dahlia, do you have a way for people to contact you if they want to get more support or hire you as a consultant? Sure. <laughs> uh, yes, I am on Facebook and Instagram at Chandler Pond Farm, C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R Pond Farm. Um, I'm also also a personal page under Dahlia Dill and our website is chandlerpondfarm.com if you want to visit us on there or email me or anything. If you have more questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Awesome. So, thanks All for right. listening. <laughs>